Lives of the Presidents Told in Words of One Syllable by Jean S. Remy Abraham Lincoln Thomas Lincoln, who was the father of Abraham Lincoln, had seen a sad sight when he was but a boy of eight years, while he and his brothers were hard at work with their father in the dense wild woods, which grew close to their small home in Kentucky. An Indian chief crept close to them. He fired one shot, and the boys saw their big strong father fall dead. They were brave boys, and while one ran for help, the others kept at bay the Indians who came from the woods. A band of men soon came to their aid and drove the fierce red men back to the woods. It was a rough, hard life in which Thomas Lincoln grew up, and he could not read or write when, at twenty years, he took as his wife Miss Nancy Hanks. She was a bright girl, and soon taught him at least to write his name. It was a poor log house in Hardin County, Kentucky, to which he took his bride, and yet in this home, so mean and small, was born, on February 12, 1809, the boy who was to be president of this great land. Few boys and girls know what it is to be as poor as this little boy was, or to lead as hard and sad a life. His clothes were thin and poor. His shoes, when he had any, were often full of holes. He did not always have as much as he would like to eat, and in the long, hard winters he was often very cold. It was not an easy life, and it was full of hard work, for people in this rough place could not read, and there were no schools. But when he was still a young boy, his folks moved to Indiana, and though there was more work to be done, life was not quite so sad, for he and his sister Nancy now had a playmate, their cousin Dennis Hanks, who was full of life and fun. Abe, as folks called him, was but eight years old when his parents went out into the West to live, but he was so strong that he could help chop down the trees of which the new home was made, then, too, he learned how to shoot the game and wild fowl in the big woods, and so could bring good things into the house to eat. But a dark time came in his life soon, for the kind, good mother took sick and died. Her death was a great loss to Abe, and he felt much grief that there was no one to say a prayer at her grave. So he wrote to the minister in the old home in Kentucky, and asked him if he would not come there and bless his mother's grave. This good man came as soon as he could, but it was a long while after her death before Abe had his wish. That winter was long and hard for the poor little boy and girl with no mother to see that they were warm or that they had good food to eat. But in the fall of 1819, the father brought home a new wife, Mrs. Sally Johnson, and now at last a ray of bright light came to stay with Abe and Nancy. The new mother was a good, kind woman and was quite rich for those days. She soon had the home bright and neat. She put good warm clothes on Abe and Nancy, saw that they had food to eat, and at once sent them to school. Abe was now eleven years old, tall and big, and of more strength than most boys of his age. His father hired him out for all sorts of work, to pitch hay, to chop wood, to help on the farm. No work was too hard for this big strong boy, but with all this work he kept at his books too. Late at night, while all the rest slept, he would study his books, and his books were few, he read them many times over. One of the books he loved the most was The Life of Washington. He was a young man for it was in March 1828 that a chance came to him to see more of life. He was hired to take a boat filled with skins down the Mississippi River to New Orleans. He did this well, and when he came back was paid a good price for it. He was just of age when his folks went to Illinois to live, and now he helped build a home, cleared a big field in which it stood, split rails to fence it in, and then went off to make his own way in life. The first thing he did was to help build a flat boat, and then take it down to New Orleans. When he came back, the man who owned the boat gave him a place in the store at New Salem, and now he had a good chance to get books to read, and you may be sure he was glad of this. He was soon known in the place as a bright young man, and one who would not lie, or steal, or do any mean thing. He was full of fun and jokes, and the folks in the town were all fond of him. He was called Honest Abe. When the Black Hawk War broke out, he went at the head of a small band of men to the seat of war. He was in no great fight, but learned much of war and how to rule the rough men who were in his care. When he came home, he was felt to be one of the first men in the town, and in 1834 he took a high place in the state. He now took up the study of law, and was soon in active practice. He had a good kind heart, and did much good to those who were too poor to pay him. In 1846 he was sent to Congress. This time he was there but one year then came back to Springfield, Illinois, and built up a fine law practice. His name was now known through all this great land, and in the slave strife he was always on the side of the slaves. 
He spoke so often for the slaves that in 1860, the South said if he was put up for president by the North and West, they would leave the Union. But he was just the man to fill this high office at this time, and as he had the most votes, he took the office of president in 1861. There is a story told of these days, which shows that Lincoln, when a great man, had no shame for the days when he was poor. Old John Hanks, who helped him build that rail fence so long ago, came to Illinois with two of those rails, and on them was a big card which told where they came from and who split them. Lincoln was just about to make a speech to a big crowd, and when he saw these rails, he said that he had split them when a boy, but thought he could do better now. Then shouts and cheers went up from the crowd, you may be sure, and from that time Lincoln was known in the race for president as the rail splitter. When he left his home to go to Washington, a great crowd came to see him off, but he was so sad he could not say much to them. There were plots to kill him at this time, and he knew it, but he gave no thought of his own life and went straight to his post of duty as president. It was with a sad heart that he saw this great land torn with war, and he would have been glad to keep peace, but this he could not do. When the South fired at the flag of the Union at Fort Sumter, a cry went up through the whole land. The South fought for what it called states' rights, the right of each state to rule in its own way. But this Lincoln would not have. He cared more for the Union than he did for the slaves. For though he thought all men should be free, he said, if he could save the Union, he did not care if not one slave was made free. He had no wish to keep the South from its rights. But at last, he felt it wise to send out a bill which said that all slaves should be free and have the same rights as white men. This land was in no state for war. Much had to be done. Clothes and food got for the troops, and arms as well had to be made or bought at once. The first great fight was at Bull Run in Virginia, and the loss of life on both sides was great. The North lost from the first. Men who had never been in a fight before went mad with fear and ran for their lives. But at the fight at Gettysburg, the men of the North were brave and fought with such skill that the great fight was won by the North. Grant was put at the head of the troops who went down to free Mississippi and it was not long before he placed the stars and stripes over this fair state. The South made a brave fight for what it thought was right and just. But as the war went on, the troops of the South were in a bad state. They could get no food, no clothes, and so many men had been shot in the last years of the war, young boys had to help fill up the ranks. Now came Sherman's march to the sea, and he took Savannah and all its guns and stores. This was a great blow and now one by one the seaports of the South fell into the hands of the North. At last General Lee, a great and good man of the South, sent word to Grant that he would come to terms and make peace. Grant was kind at this hard time. He let Lee keep his sword, and said that the men might keep all their horses. It was in April 1865 that peace came to our great land, and the North went mad with joys. Bells pealed, and fires blazed in the streets. Flags were raised and guns were fired, but in the South there was no joy, only great grief. From the grief of the South a great crime sprang. On the night of April 14th, as Lincoln sat in a box at the theater watching a play, he was shot by a man from the South named Wilkes Booth. When he had shot Lincoln, this man sprang on the stage and tried to run from the place. He fell and broke his leg, but in this state he got to the door, where he jumped on his horse and fled for his life. He was found at last in a barn, and made such a brave fight for his life that the barn had to be set on fire before he could be caught. Even then he would not come out and give himself up, but fought till he was shot down where he stood. Lincoln had been shot in the back of his head, and could not move or speak. Men took him with care to a house nearby, but there was no help for him, and in the early morn of the next day a great life came to a sad end. The whole land, the south as well as the north, wept at his death for no sane man felt that Booth's deed was wise or just, and to this day the name of Abraham Lincoln, the savior of his country, is held dear by North and South. End of chapter 16